Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux. This is Last Week in the Church, the show devoted to bringing you news you've already heard because it's already happened. On this week's lineup, here's what we've got. The Cop Flop. Vatican reaction to a much ballyhooed climate change summit in Glasgow that is ended, at least according to its critics, with a whimper rather than a bang. From Russia with love, the Vatican's top diplomat makes a trek to Moscow and manages to get himself in some hot water with Polish Catholics for comments about the border crisis between Belarus and Poland. Abortion and politicians. The U.S. bishops begin their annual, me annual fall meeting today. Top of the agenda is a document regarding the Eucharist that some had hoped, anyway, might contain some tough language about giving, a, a giving communion or withholding communion from pro-choice Catholic politicians. A knighthood for a couple of journalists. Two veteran members of the Vatican Press Corps are awarded papal knighthoods by Pope Francis on Saturday. And finally, Dinner with the Popes, a new book, twins two of my favorite things, Catechism and the Kitchen. That's what we've got on the menu for you this week, so please stick around. Well, first of all, happy Monday to you. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Mine was great, but I'll give you the highlight. I've got to give a special shout out to my University of Kansas Jayhawks. I'm a graduate of the school, enormously proud of it, but I will tell you that typically cheering for the KU football team is a pretty dismal experience. But over the weekend, improbably, KU actually beat the University of Texas, a perennial college football powerhouse, on the road snapping an 0 and 70 streak when KU had been at least a 20 point underdog and a 50 some game streak of losing every Big 12 road game they played. You know, this is not quite as weird as the Earth colliding with another planet, but it is up there. So what I have to say to this audience is, rock chuck Jayhawk, baby, go KU. All right, we begin this week with the much talked about, much dissected, much discussed COP26, Climate Change Summit in Glasgow, which wrapped up over the weekend with a renewed commitment uh, from the nations of the world to trying to, main, uh, to restrict the annual rise in to average temperatures to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. There was also much talk about the urgency of the climate change situation, but in the eyes of climate activists, critics, it was, well, to quote economist Jeffrey Sachs, a failure. Or, to quote the oracle on all matters climate change these days, teenager Greta Thunberg, this summit amounted to blah, blah, blah. What they are most unhappy with while there was a renewed commitment to that 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, no new indications of how people are going to achieve these goals, nor were there any new sanctions for failing to do so. Also, no new commitments on the financial front. In 2009, more than a decade ago, developed nations committed that by 2020, they would give $100 billion a year to developing nations to help them afford the transition to a sustainable green economy. That has not happened. No indication that it's likely to happen in the wake of Glasgow. And perhaps most controversially, on the fossil fuel front, the draft of the Glasgow Agreement pledged nations to phase out coal under pressure from India and China, that got changed to phase down. So a commitment to a reduction, but not elimination. In the eyes of people who had loftier aims, therefore, kind of a big disappointment. Now, to date, the Vatican publicly has not joined the chorus of critics. Uh, the Vatican did have a delegation at Glasgow. They were especially firm on this idea of the financing of the transition to a sustainable economy and the need for wealthier nations to take responsibility and assist poorer nations in accomplishing that. Of course, the Vatican, one of the Vatican's complaints about climate change and a strong theme 
in Laudato Si, the Pope's encyclical on the environment, is that while rich nations are disproportionately responsible for climate change, poor nations disproportionately suffer its consequences. However, I think the Vatican is like, you know, politicians and diplomats everywhere trying to put a brave face on things. They don't want to be too publicly critical. Over the weekend, Pope Francis, in his Sunday Angelus address, addressed Glasgow briefly, basically calling on political leaders to be more courageous and far-sighted in addressing climate change, and also called on an active citizenry to do its part. Now, you might ask, what does the Pope mean by an active citizenry? Well, as fate would have it, the Vatican over the weekend also launched its new Laudato Si action plan. The reference, of course, is to the Pope's green encyclical, and this is a concrete set of commitments that it's calling upon organizations and individuals to make to try to advance the goals of protecting the environment and creating a more sustainable economy. So it includes things like commitment to use more renewable energy, commitment to eat less meat, a point at which I'm going to confess I am slightly dubious. But nevertheless, I have vowed in the spirit of Laudato Si, I'm giving up processed luncheon meat, which I do, believe it or not, I do sometimes buy that at the store. They have it even here in Italy. But I'm going to forswear it in the spirit of Laudato Si. Just don't ask me to give up Bucatini alla Matrociana, which uses guanciale. It's the special cut of pork from the cheek of a pig. I live on that stuff. No. But less, less. How about this way? I will phase down my meat consumption. I'm not going to phase it out. Another point in this plan is to, to take advantage of ecological education and spirituality, try to deepen that, and also to try to work towards less use of fossil fuels. To date, more than 4,000 Catholic organizations have already committed themselves to this, the entire Jesuit order, the Salesian Sisters, the California Bishops' Conference, the Archdiocese of Chicago, and on and on. That, I think, is what Pope Francis has in mind by an active citizenry. And I think what it indicates is that the Pope, the Vatican, they don't want to put all their eggs in the basket of these major political global summits. But they also want to try to tackle this problem on the micro level. We shall see. All right, second, from Russia with love. British Archbishop Paul Gallagher, the Vatican's Secretary for Relations with States, basically its foreign minister, was in Russia late last week for meetings, not with Vladimir Putin, but with the Russian prime minister and also with the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. And obviously, this was framed as a wide-ranging bilateral consultation on a lot of stuff. But obviously, one of the points touched was the massive crisis at the border between Belarus the migrant crisis at the border between Belarus and Poland. Now, where this got discussed publicly was in a press conference that Gallagher and Lavrov held jointly after their meeting. Obviously, they were asked about the crisis. Gallagher gave what you might consider a kind of standard Vatican answer, which is, we want to remind people, we want to remind everybody that we're dealing with human beings here and not just statistics. He called for a humanitarian solution to the crisis. When pressed specifically about Poland, Gallagher said, look, I, I think some in the Polish church have already been critical of a use of force. This problem cannot be solved with violence. So, I mean, even though he was just quoting the Polish church, the perception was that he was being a little bit critical maybe of Poland. Then when it was Lavrov's turn, what he suggested is that, the, the well, Lavrov pointed out that in 2016, the EU made a deal with Turkey. Basically, it would pay Turkey to take back migrants and refugees who had tried to enter the EU through Turkey. And so Lavrov had proposed that the EU do the same thing, pay off Belarus to keep the migrants and refugees on its side of the border until they could be permanently settled someplace. Now. <laughs> Neither one of these points played especially well in Catholic Poland, okay? The sight of the Vatican's foreign minister standing next to a senior official in the Putin regime. Remember, 
polls actually think this whole crisis has been orchestrated by Russia to try to destabilize Poland because they don't like Poland standing up to Moscow. So when Polish Catholics heard that Gallagher, first of all, had in their eyes kind of thrown them under the bus with Lavrov, and then when Lavrov went in this thing about Belarus actually getting paid by the EU for this crisis, and Gallagher did not contradict him or demure, that created some hot water for Gallagher and for the Vatican in Poland. I spent part of my morning reading translated versions of various social media postings in Catholic circles in Poland. And Archbishop Gallagher, if you're watching, my recommendation is stay away from that stuff. I mean, for your health, for your digestion, you just believe me, you're better off not knowing. And what it indicates, of course, is what a tightrope Vatican diplomats have to walk any time they address a crisis like this. I think Gallagher was trying to play it down the middle, trying to indicate the Vatican's concern without embarrassing his host. But, you know, inevitably, it can't make everybody happy all of the time. And this is another case in point. Uh, all right, politicians and abortion. U.S. bishops uh, are meeting beginning today through the 18th, Wednesday, for their fall meeting. And they will be discussing a document on the Eucharist. There had been hopes among some conservative Catholics, that this document might adopt a tough stance on the vexed question of communion for pro-choice Catholic politicians, up to in, and including the commander-in-chief in the United States, President Joe Biden, the country's second Roman Catholic president, also House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and others. Now, and that was debated a lot, and of course the Vatican sort of got drawn into this, before the first time the bishops talked about it several months ago, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith sent a letter cautioning them against doing that. Pope Francis waded into it during an airborne news conference a couple months ago, basically saying he's against communion bans. He's never turned anybody away, he said. And he called on bishops to be pastors, not politicians. Now, the draft of that document that was presented to the U.S. bishops just a few days ago in preparation for this meeting does not contain any reference, any language about a communion ban. It actually only mentions abortion once. Now, it does contain a line that Catholics with public authority have a special responsibility to follow church teaching, but that's it. No indication of what the disciplinary consequences would be if they don't do that. And so it may actually not be quite as explosive as had, at least in some circles, been thought or been hoped for. Uh, but we still have to see what happens when this comes up for discussion on the floor. There may be some bishops who want to press for tougher language. We'll have to see how that plays out. What's worth remembering in all this is that while the discussion at the bishops' conference is interesting, it's all non-binding, a bishop's conference cannot tell an individual bishop what to do. So the reality is hardline bishops are going to go home and still be hardline. You know, softer bishops will still be soft. And so this will be really little more than an interesting way to take the temperature uh, of the conference. I, I suppose one other point that is worth making about all this is that the original impetus for this document was a recent Gallup poll which found that one third of American Catholics do not believe that the bread and wine consumed at mass becomes literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that Eucharistic faith is as close to a core doctrine in the Catholic Church as you're ever going to find. And news that one third of the US bishops flock doesn't buy it you know, it has to be alarming. So, you know, one hopes that this document isn't simply going to dodge or do whatever it ends up doing, the question about communion from politicians. One hopes it sparks something on the order of a renaissance in Eucharistic faith and practice because the evidence would suggest that the church in the U.S. could use it. All right, fourth on our rundown this week, Two veteran Vatican correspondents, Valentina Alzacari, a Mexican TV correspondent, and Phil Puella, an American 
who works for Reuters, both of whom have covered the Vatican since the early John Paul II year. Valentina was actually on John Paul's very first trip in 1979, coincidentally to Mexico, to Puebla for a conference of the Latin American bishops. She gave him a sombrero on that flight, and I think has given Pope sombreros every time they've gone to Mexico. She's only missed, she only missed a couple of flights during that entire span when she was pregnant with her kids, which means that Valentina has actually taken more papal trips than any pope alive or dead. She is number one in terms of the single individual who was flown most often aboard the papal plane. Phil's probably number two. They were awarded, and this was a personal initiative of Pope Francis, by the way. This is not standard Vatican protocol. They were awarded the Order of St. Pius IX, which is the highest honor that the Vatican bestows on laity. Pope Francis used the occasion to deliver him, himself of some thoughts about journalism, encouraged journalists not to see the Catholic Church as a parliament or a multinational corporation, but for what it really is, an instrument of salvation. Also thanked journalists for uncovering negative stories about the church, saying that coverage of scandal and of things that aren't right in the church has helped the church not to sweep those things under the rugs. Also, he thanked journalists for giving voice to the victims of abuse. So a big shout out to the journalistic profession and to these two journalists in particular who are regarded as the deans of the Vatican Press Corps. Now, journos being the kind of cantankerous creature as we are, to be honest with you, not everybody was, was totally thrilled with this. Some of our colleagues thought it is inappropriate to be receiving honors from the people you're supposed to cover. Because how are you supposed to be objective? Magari, how are you supposed to be critical if these newsmakers are showering you with honors? But I think what was universal among people who cover the Vatican was happiness for these two people because Phil and Valentina have been doing this longer than anybody else and yet they're still hungry for the story. They still show up at everything. They still hustle after the news. If you can't admire that, you know, there's something wrong with you. So regardless of what you think about the philosophical question of how close we ought to get to our sources, huge shout out to Phil and Valentina and everything they've accomplished over multiple decades. Finally, Dinner with the Popes. There is a new book that just hit Italian bookshelves. No plans yet for a translation in English, but hope it's coming soon. It's called A Cena con i Papi, uh, at Dinner with the Popes. And this is a book kind of about what popes through the ages have eaten, their favorite dishes. But now, there are a lot of pope cookbooks out there, honestly, believe it or not. It's a popular subgenre of Vatican literature. But what makes this book unique is that its author, Fiorenza Cidli, who, by the way, is a distinguished historian here in Rome, she wrote a book a couple of years ago called Roma Distrutta, Rome Destroyed, about attempts to destroy Rome from the era of Attila the Hun on the, all the way to the present. It's a brilliant book. That one is in English translation. I highly recommend it, among other things. It shows you why they call Rome the eternal city, because you can take your best shot, it's going to keep coming back. Anyway, what's distinct about this book is that it's not just what popes like to eat. It's what ordinary people like to eat during the time when particular popes served. So, for instance, she has this brilliant cha chapter on the era of the Lateran Pax that deal between the Vatican under Pius XI and Mussolini that settled the Roman question. The Vatican recognized the independence of the new Italian Republic. The Italian Republic, in turn, recognized the sovereignty of the Vatican City State and also paid a lump sum compensation for the loss of other papal territory. She has a couple of dishes that were very popular in Italy in the late 20s and early 30s, really allows you to enter into the spirit and the taste uh, of that era. For Pope Francis, she emphasizes a couple of dishes that are very popular in the Piedmont, that's the mountainous region of northern Italy where the Bergoglio family comes from, including Bagna calda, it's this dipping sauce for vegetables made largely of garlic and anchovies. I mean, it is strong medicine, but if you ever want to know how people up in the Alps survive cold winters, 
eating a hot pot of banya calda, I mean, it's, it's strong medicine, but it will get you through those cold nights. And in any event, it allows you to enter in a kind of sensory, tactile way into the world of various figures uh, in church history. It's just, it's terrific. And listen, two of my favorite things, two of the great passions in my life are church history and cooking. You find a way to, co to combine them. You've made a fan out of me. I am a fan of this book. Hope it is available in other languages, but if you read Italian, I highly recommend it. A Cena con i Papi. Brilliant book, Fiorenza Chile. All right, that's what we've got for this week. Thanks for being with us. We will be here next Monday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, you can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping for the destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. While you're on the site, you will see a handy-dandy, easy-peasy box to make a quick donation to us if you are of such a mind, if you're able to. We would be deeply grateful. We especially love people who are willing to make a small monthly commitment, five bucks, 10 bucks, you know, whatever it is, maybe what you'd spend on a cup of coffee or streaming a movie this month. But that gives us stability. It gives us the ability to make plans. Remember, our independence is precious, but it ain't free. We need your help to maintain it. Over the next week, my charge to you is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will be here next week bringing you the stale news once again. See you then.